you don't know, my name is Doug. I'm one of the teaching pastors here. Actually, my wife Stephanie and I founded Rust City 10 years ago, and we are in a brand new series called The Blessed Life. Last week, Pastor Brad kicked us off with an amazing message. If you didn't get to hear it, jump back in our website, get on our YouTube, go somewhere online, and you can find last week's message as he set up the table for what it means to live the blessed life. For you and I to experience as we're on this planet, the blessing of God, it's not so much that we are giving to getting, it's not so much that we're trying to manipulate God, it's simply the fact that his scripture aligns that there are blessings for those who can follow God in obedience, and we want to access those, we want to see those, and I don't know exactly what the blessed life definition for you is, not everyone has the same definition of it, but we know this, that God will bless his people, God wants to pour out his blessings on you and I, and as we follow scripture, we can follow a blessed life. Amen? And so we want to continue in this series through this month, and I am doing part two of that. But before I get into it, uh, last week, one of our church families, actually the husband, ended up having to go to the hospital uh, for something to do with his heart and some blood pressure, and they wanted to monitor it. So they actually kept him overnight, and they couldn't come to church last week. And so uh, part of what happens is if we find out someone's in the hospital, we send a little care package from our church just to say we're praying for you, we're thinking of you, we want to be a blessing. If you ever know of somebody who's in the hospital, let us know. We want to bless them. And we found out that this guy was in the hospital, and so we sent him a little care package last week. And, and what happened is he missed Sunday church, and he had to stay overnight again. And he says, oh, I can watch online. And so he decided to tune in online while he was in the hospital. And he shot me a text message actually this week and said, hey, I want to tell you what God did as I listened to Pastor Brad's message part one of The Blessed Life, and here's what the text said. He said, it's been on my heart for a while now to give, uh, so I, but I never took the leap. And I was sitting in the hospital right now, and I opened my la laptop to Rust City's website and watched the message from this weekend, and I decided to take the 90-day tithe challenge, which is our challenge to say if Malachi 3 says that if you tithe to the storehouse, God will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on your life. So here at Rust City, we are so confident in the word of God and so confident that he wants to pour a blessing out in your life that we're giving you a 90-day money-back guarantee that you can choose to tithe, trust God with a tenth of your giving, and if it does not work to what you think God should do, we will give it all back to you, no strings attached. So so he took the 90-day tithe challenge, and he says, I gave my 10% of my monthly income, and then the nurse knocked on the door of my room and walked in with a gift from Rust City in her hands. You can't, you can't stage this, folks, so come on now. He said, I knew immediately, say immediately. I knew immediately that God's blessing was on my obedience. Listen, he gave because he already was on his heart. He knew he wanted to trust God in this space. So he decided, hey, I've got a money back guarantee. If it doesn't work, don't give me my money back. So I'm going to go ahead and take this opportunity. I'm going to do this, what the Lord is leading me. Then he gets a knock on the door. His nurse walks in with his itty-bitty little care package that our church gives. We had no idea that all this is going on, but God does. And then he gets this and receives it and knew immediately, God, you are blessing my obedience. I think for so many of us, if we're not careful, we want emotional feelings and we want it always to feel like amazing when we do something. We have to learn as we mature in our Christianity that we don't need feelings to be obedient to the Lord, knowing as we're obedient, God always does what he's going to do. Like if I do my part, come on with me, church. If I do my part, God will always do his part. Like, so often we, we struggle with this because we want it to feel good. We want it to always feel like an emotional high. But God gives us an invitation when it comes to trusting him with our money, trusting him in this area, that if you are obedient, I will do my part if you do your part. And this young man sent me this text, and it just blew me away, and I absolutely wanted to share it with you today. Today, in my part of The Blessed Life, we're going to talk about the difference between the law, which is found in the Old Testament, and the grace that Jesus gives. Now, I've been pastoring for almost 20 years now. Now, I know when you look at me, you think, how did he start at seven? I don't understand how somebody could become a pastor at that age. Bless you in your heart so much for that. 
But I've been pastoring for long enough to hear a lot of excuses on why people don't want to follow God in this area because this is where the rubber begins to meet the road in our Christianity. This goes from, okay, I just casually attend church and I like the feeling that worship gives me and the feeling that the message gives me to, hey, God, you own everything. I am yours. I will follow you. And in every area, I will give you what you ask for. When we get to that point, this is when you start separating those that are really following Jesus and those are following a show. And so you have this moment where, 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 where I've, I've encountered people on this journey where they're like, well, pastor, I hear you, but you don't understand something about the New Testament. When Jesus came, he gave grace on all areas. He finished the law, he completed the law, and we don't have to live underneath the law anymore. That was for those who didn't have Jesus, but because we have Jesus, we don't need to do that any longer. Now we can just live under the grace of God. And it's interesting you have that idea, because if that's the way we want to run our lives, then that has to apply to every area of our life. Now follow me. Let's imagine that you invited my wife and I over for dinner next week. You said, we really want to bless our pastors. We're going to get babysitting for their kids. Come on, somebody. Inviting me to dinner is not enough, okay? You want me to come over and eat with you, you got to figure out what to do with my three crazy ginger babies, okay? <laughs> Don't put that on me. Put that on you. <laughs> Pastor, come over. Well, what you want me to do with the wild boys, Okay. And so you said, we're going to get babysitting lined up for pastor. We're going to invite him over. We want to have dinner with pastor and Stephanie. It's going to be the nicest night. You guys bring out all your fine china. It's going to be this great night. We're going to have a pot roast. It's going to be all good in the hood. And we're eating, and we're finishing up the meal, and it's been great, and God's been good, and we can feel his presence, and we're ending the night. And I go to walk out the house with my wife, and we notice in your living room a beautiful new flat-screen television with all the trimmings, all the little smart technology, all the things that I can't figure out, but my three-year-old does effortlessly. And I decide in that moment with my wife, I go, hey, Steph, we're leaving. And we pick up your TV and we begin to walk out your house. We just pick it up, unplug it, and we go right out the house with that TV. Now, I would like to imagine in this fictitious story that we've created that you would stop me and not just go, well, bless God, pastor's taking the TV out of the house. You would say, hey, what's, what's going on now? And I go, oh, I just, I, I really like your TV and I want it. You'd be like, no, wait, wait, that's our TV. You can't, well, and I say, well, why? Why can't I just take this TV from you right now? Well, you can't because it's illegal. But beyond that, why does it matter? I mean, like, if you don't call the police, this isn't a big deal. Just let me have your TV. And you say, dude, you're a pastor, right? Like, have you read the Bible? There's these things called the Ten Commandments. Thou shall not what? <laughs> you guys are like Bible scholars here at Rusty the Church. <laughs> Thou shall not steal. And you want to quote that at me, and then I just simply reply back, oh, dude, come on. You're living under the law, my friend. I live under the grace of Jesus, okay? God's grace is sufficient. I know that's the Old Testament and that's the law, but we don't live under that. So I can do whatever I want to do because I got greasy grace in my life. You would literally be like, no, you can't do that. That's not okay, and that is not how things are supposed to go. But see, when it comes to our generosity, we like to mask things with, I live under the grace of Jesus, but I want the law to apply to other areas of our life. I'm going to give you Jesus' words here, Matthew chapter 5, because I don't know if I've convinced you just yet, and I can't convince you, but I'm hoping that Jesus can convince you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 says it like this. Jesus says these words, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law. Say abolish. abolish. I didn't come to abolish it. I didn't come to say it is now over. I did not come to end it. Abe Lincoln abolished slavery, which means now you can no longer have slaves in the United States of America. Jesus is saying, I did not come to abolish this, but instead I have come to accomplish its purposes. See, I didn't come to abolish the law of Moses and the writings of the prophet. No, I came to accomplish their purposes. Now, check this out, verse 21. Let's jump ahead a little bit here. See, you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder. For whoever murders will mean danger of judgment. One, And then it goes on to this, verse 22. But I say to you, whoever is in anger with his brother without cause is in danger of that very same judgment. Another translation says it like this. 
You've heard it said, you should not murder. But I say to you this, if you even have anger in your heart towards your brother, you've already committed the deed before God. You've already done the deed in God's eyes when you carry this anger and resentment towards those that you're supposed to love. You've already done it in God's eyes. Notice how Jesus took it up a level. He didn't take it down a level. Now, let's keep going. Verse 27. See, you've heard it said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery, which is sleeping with somebody who's not your spouse. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed the adultery, the sin against God, in their own heart. So, so here's Jesus. He shows up, and people are trying to get him to take on the law and say, well, listen, what are you trying to do here? And he said, I, I, I didn't come to abolish it and to push it away. I came to fulfill it. I came to show you that you couldn't do it, but I can do it because I am God in flesh. But let me up the ante a little bit for you because some of you are going to misunderstand what I am trying to teach here in this moment. This is one of the most misunderstood parts of Christianity that somehow, some way, we just keep missing this over and over and over and over again. We take the grace of Jesus and think it gives us permission to go do slimy things and not follow God's law any longer in our life. No, the opposite. Jesus comes in and says, you've heard you should not murder. Well, I'm telling you, if you're angry at somebody unjustly, you've already committed the murder in your heart. In God's eyes, you've already done the deed. Hey, you should not commit adultery. You should stay faithful to the one that you are married to. I am telling you that if you already, if you lust for somebody who's not your spouse and you've already committed the act, the sin has already happened inside of your heart. So here we are, church, Jesus is laying down something for us to pick up. He is not saying that when I showed up, Jesus, that now you no longer have to live under the standards of the law. What he is saying is this, where I show up, we don't lower the standards of God, we raise the standards of God. Catch what I'm saying here. When it comes to Jesus and following him, He, yes, forgives us of our sins. He, yes, forgives us of all of the things that we have done wrong in our lives. And he says, your slate is wiped clean. You are no longer a son of the devil. You're now a son of God. You're no longer entrapped by sin. You are set free. The Bible says who the son sets free is free indeed. But then he says this, once you've accepted that freedom, you don't lower your standard of God. You begin to live at a higher standard. You don't lower what you used to be like. You say, well, I I can get away with it now because I have the grace of God in my life. No. You say, God, because you love me so much, Jesus, because you gave it all, in response, I choose to give it all back to you. So here's what happens in today's Christianity when it comes to our money. Because most of us, our money is our God. It's how we operate because money buys us the things that we worship. We worship our cars. We worship our houses. We worship our clothing. We worship what we can buy our kids. We worship our Christmas experiences on Sunday morning. Come on, somebody. We worship things that we ought not worship because money gets us those things. Jesus does not come to lower your standard of giving to say, well, you're under grace now. You don't have to follow the Old Testament. He fulfilled it. When Jesus shows up, he raises the standard. He does not lower the standards. So if you want to live by grace, then the 10%, which the Old Testament told us to live by, ought to be your floor, not your ceiling. It ought to be your floor to say, well, if that's the the standard that was set at the Old Testament and Jesus raises the standard in the New Testament, then I got to quit acting like 10% is some lofty goal to get to. That ought to be the floor to what God wants to do in my life if I'm going to live by grace. That I ought to then say, God, I'm not going to be held down. See, under grace, Jesus doesn't lower the standard, but he raises it. And when it comes to giving, Jesus never lowers his standards. He always raises it. And so here's my encouragement to you. If you're going to really follow Jesus, follow him in every area of your life. Don't be one of these Christians who buffets Jesus. Don't be one of these Christians who looks around and says, well, you know, I like this part of Jesus, but I like this part of Dr. Phil, too, what he says about it. I like this part of what this. Either it needs to fully work for you, or I guess what, it's never going to work for you. 
Either he's Lord of everything or he can be Lord of nothing in your life. And for so many of us in our lives, I don't know why it's like this. It was this for me as well on my journey of giving to him. But I struggled because I kept thinking if I give to God what he's asking of me, I won't have enough to take care of myself. And God's invitation is this. Listen, Doug, you won't have enough, but watch what I will do when you trust me instead of trusting yourself. The numbers won't always work, but when you trust God in this area and you say, God, I give it to you. I'm going to not hold back what your word says for me to do. I'm going to be begin to declare over me and my family and my life, no matter what, we are blessed because we are honoring God in this space of our life. My desire is that you can come to God boldly, not come to God timidly because you didn't do the things he asked you to do. See, some of our worship will look different when we begin to tithe and give back to God what he owes and what he says, hey, give this to me and watch what I'll do with the rest that you have. Some of your worship is going to begin to look different because you're going to be able to worship God freely knowing you're not holding things back from him any longer. It's hard to worship when you know, man, I'm just not doing what God's asked me to do. And there are people who have built their whole life on this identity that I live under the grace of Jesus, which to them translates to I get to escape out of some things. And in all reality, he did not come to abolish the Old Testament. He came to fulfill its purposes, and he came to raise the standard of our giving. To say, Jesus, I'm going to be known. Wouldn't it be amazing for people to know you by your generosity? Wouldn't it be amazing for people to see you and say, man, when I see that guy, when I see that girl, I just know they are wildly generous and they give and God just seems to continue to bless them in life. I don't see how God will not honor his word if he really is God. You know, our church had a campus downtown for a while and we had that building, we had it paid off, we put a bunch of money into it. We put lots of money into it, to be honest with you, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And when we knew God was leading us to come back to one campus, and the goal was eventually to find a location and to get a permanent home for our church, one location under my leadership until God calls me to something else, I knew that we had this building and this asset downtown that we might need to use to help secure loans and future endeavors for us to build the building that I know God's put in our heart to build. And so I didn't want to let go of it. And it was also a really great storage unit downtown for all of our stuff, okay? So there were several reasons I didn't want to let go of this building. But God kept working on my heart, kept working on our hearts. And then I got a phone call from a friend of mine who's got a ministry that really couldn't afford to buy it. I knew that. And he loved this location. He loved the building, and he wanted it. And, man, I just was wrestling with giving this away. I'm like, dude, this is an asset. We need this at Rust City to get to our future. And I submitted it to our elders. I said, hey, I, I don't know what you guys want to do. We just got to see what God wants to do. I don't know. And the elders unanimously said, I think we should give it to them. Well, we might not get anything out of this. Well, let's just see if we, let's see if the word is true. Can we outgive God? I'm going to tell you the day that I gave them keys, my butt cheeks had never been tighter. Can I say I did not want to do it, and that's okay? Is this a safe place? I don't want to give it away. I was wrestling. My wife, we put years into that campus. We just going to give it to somebody else. They're going like, we're like giving a kid away here. And we did. And after I did it, I just thanked the Lord for the goodness that we had at that location. I thank the God for many of you who are from that location and are still part of our church. And I said, Lord, I bless whatever that is. Or whatever it's going to be, it's your kingdom, not my kingdom. And wouldn't you know, when we sent out the email and, you know, when we announced it to the church here, y'all clapped and cheered. I said, isn't it fun when I give away something that ain't yours? You're just like, ah, that's wonderful. Give away more stuff, Pastor Doug. <laughs> Thank you. We sent out the email. And I get a phone call from somebody who I know to be very generous. Very generous, very wealthy human being. And we talked about the store. We talked about what we're doing. And he said, cool, great. Now that you've done that, I want to know how much you put into the building for it to be what it was. I said, we put, pro and I'm not exaggerating, we put probably $250,000 into that space. Quarter million dollars. He said, cool. I want to give you a check for that much money because I want you to know that you cannot outgive God. 
Now, when he said it, the next thing I said was, that was phase one. That's actually double that amount if you want to. <laughs> hey, your pastor's always hustling. Come on, somebody. <laughs> We're always on a hustle, baby. He said, I knew you'd say that, you snake in the grass. <laughs> you can't outgive God. So why are you running from it? Test him. I've seen his goodness over and over again as I continue to give back to him. And if you want one more example in Acts chapter 2, it shows us very clearly. God's first disciples, the original disciples who followed Jesus after he ascended to heaven, says this in Acts chapter 2, verse 45. They sold their properties and their possessions, and they shared. Say shared. They didn't do it for their own gains. They shared it with the kingdom of God so it can grow. I want to encourage you. Don't be selfish. Selfish people ruin the world. Selfless people can change it. Why don't we change the world together? And let's not just talk about church. Let's be the church in every area, including the area of our finances. And I'm going to challenge you. Take the 90-day tithe challenge. Step up. We'll, you can read it. It's all on there. We'll give it back to you. But here's what I believe. Once you start that discipline and you surrender this area of your life to God, you will not look back because you will realize, I would rather do it with him than do it without him. Amen? Let me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray for every single person here. That God, that you give them strength supernaturally to trust you. God, that they would know that you are for them, not against them. That you are working all things out for good for those that love you. God, I pray, Lord, for every person who is struggling to surrender this, like my friend who texted me this week. That they would have a confirmation that you are doing things. And, God, that they would just take the nudge to say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you instead of trusting my own ways. I'm going to lean not on myself. I'm going to lean on you. So, God, I just pray for a boldness like never before to trust you in this area, to truly step into the beginnings of the blessed life. God, we don't know how you'll do and what you'll do with it, but we know as we trust you in this area, we are holding nothing back from you. So, God, if this is a barrier, let it be laid down. And my prayer is that every person would imagine what their life would be following your blessings as you have decreed them in Malachi 3, that you would open up the windows of heaven and you'd pour out blessings on our lives. We don't know what they look like. We just want them from you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, can we thank God for his goodness and his grace in this space?